them, nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. So this was before the Quran had been collected. This is during the reign of Abu Bakr. Specifically says, the Quran had not been collected by that time. He says that passages, many passages of the Quran that were sent down, were known by the people who died in that battle, but they were not known by anyone after them. These passages were lost. And what seems to be the case here, it was a brilliant strategy for a person who really believes in the power of Allah and really believes that Islam is true. Abu Bakr apparently reasoned, well, Allah has said that he's going to protect the Quran. Therefore, if I take all of the Hufas, the people who have portions of the Quran memorized, and I send this group into battle, they will be an invincible army. Because there's no way Allah is going to let them be defeated, because that will be the destruction of the Quran. Mm. So I'm going to take all the people who have the Quran memorized, send them into battle, and Allah is going to protect them. They'll be an invincible army. And the army was slaughtered. And what happened? According to uh, Ibn Abi Dawud himself, Many passages of the Quran were lost that day, and no one, no one who came after them had these passages. What happened? Well, Abu Bakr recognized more of the Quran is going to be lost. More of the Quran is going to be lost here uh, if, if we keep uh, going out into battle. And I can't allow any more of the Quran to be lost, any more passages of the Quran to be lost. And so we need to collect this. So that's the basic idea. Um, and ev eventually, uh, uh, so Abu Bakr made a copy of the Quran. This was not put out as any sort of official version of the Quran that all Muslims had to agree with. Uh, this was simply passed to Umar. Then when Umar died, it was passed to Hafsa. And later on, uh, during the reign of Uthman, people had so many different versions of the Quran going around that uh, Uthman began to worry that, uh, that there were going to be disputes among Muslims about different versions of the Quran. And so he hatched a plan, hey, everyone, send me. Send me your copies of the Quran. I got a little plan here. And when he did that, uh, Zayd ibn Thabit uh, went through everything. He compiled an official version, and then Uthman destroyed all the other versions of the Quran and put that one version of the Quran out. Now, if Muslims think, if Muslims think that all these people had the same Quran or something like that, or that these were just dialects, uh, no, there were some major differences between these these Qurans. Some people believe the Quran only had. Uh, 111 chapters. Some believe that the Quran had 116 chapters as opposed to the 114 that are in the Quran today. Mm -hmm. And these aren't just any random people. The people who disagreed with the Quran that you have today happen to be Muhammad's top experts on the Quran. Muhammad himself, if you believe he's a prophet, then you must believe what he said here. Muhammad himself in Sahih al-Bukhari said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from four. You learn it from Abdullah ibn Masud, you learn it from Muad ibn Jubal. You learn it from uh, uh, Salim, the freed slave of Abu, Abu Hudayfa. Or you learn it from Ubay ibn Kab. You learn the Quran from these four people. These are the four best people when it comes to knowing the Quran. Notice who he didn't put on there. He didn't put Uthman on there. He didn't put Zayd ibn Thabit on there. That's where your Quran today comes from. And what's interesting is that Muhammad's top experts in the Quran couldn't even agree on what goes into the Quran. Mm. Um, so you find that Abdullah ibn Masud believed that the Quran should only have 111 surahs. Surah 1, Surah 113, and Surah 114. According to Abdullah ibn Masud, that's Muhammad's top expert, this is his main man, believed that those surahs were not part of the Quran. Uh, Ubay ibn Ka believed, yes, everything that's in the Quran right now is supposed to be in the Quran, but there are two extra surahs that are supposed to be in the Quran that are not in your Quran today. Mm. So think about this. Muhammad says, you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from these guys. And those guys say something different from what you have in your Quran today. And then this Quran ultimately goes back to a person that wasn't on Muhammad's list as his four top experts in the recitation of the Quran. So you're stuck with a little problem here. If you believe Muhammad's a prophet and he knows, what's, and he knows best what Muslims should believe, you have to believe that one of his four experts is the one who has the Quran right. But, but they disagreed with this Quran that you have today. Uh, or if you want to say, no, this is the Quran, this is the Quran, then you have to say Muhammad was wrong when he picked his top experts in the Quran. So, e so you're either stuck with, the, you're, you're stuck with one or two things. One, you're stuck with either this Quran is wrong, because Muhammad said follow, follow those guys who had different Qurans, 
Or you say this is the right Quran, in which case Muhammad was wrong. If he's wrong about that, he was wrong about the Quran, what else was he wrong about? Mm. But during the course of this show, we can go into, uh, any time we have a little bit of time, we can go into many examples of things like missing chapters of the Quran. Entire chapters that we know are now missing, that were, that were revealed to Muhammad, that were given by Muhammad to his followers, and which his followers later lost. This doesn't come from from Jewish or Christian sources. This comes from texts like Sahih Muslim, one of your most reliable collections of ahadith. We'll see that large portions of surahs were missing. For instance, Surah 33, uh, two-thirds of that surah is gone. This is not according to me. This is according to Aisha. Aisha herself and Ubay ibn Kaab, one of Muhammad's top experts in the Quran, say that two-thirds, more than a hundred, more than a hundred verses of that, of that, of that surah are gone. They're missing. They're no longer in there. Muslims forgot them. Uh, we'll see all kinds of things like this, and we'll show you all of this from your sources. And at the end of all this, I, I have to ask you, if your leaders are constantly telling you the Quran has been perfectly preserved, and all of the evidence and all of your sources, even the Quran itself, by the way, says that it hasn't been perfectly preserved, then it's obvious that your leaders are telling you things that aren't true. And if they're telling you things that aren't true, what else are they telling you that's not true? And why are they telling you things that aren't true? Excellent. Thank you, David. And let me just to make one more comment before we take our first caller. You see, what David is basically saying here is that there are many opportunities for the corruption of the Quran from the time that it left the mouth of Muhammad all the way up until uh, the third caliph, Uthman. There are many opportunities. There is much evidence that the Quran was corrupted between the time from... Actually, even in the mouth of Muhammad, he said himself that there was a time when Satan put verses in his mouth. And we know that was corrupted. But assuming that what Muhammad said is really your Quran from the time of Muhammad until this Uthmanic recension there was huge opportunities many opportunities and much evidence that the Quran was corrupted but we also have 100% uh, proof that the Quran from the time of Uthman until today has been corrupted and you can find that on online there is evidence uh, I would tell you to go to one book in particular a perfect Quran you can find the evidence online or in this book he actually has uh, photocopies of Qurans with not only different diacritical marks but with actual different Arabic letters since the time of Uthman and remember <laughs> in the, the very beginning the Quran didn't have diacritical marks at all and if you know anything about Semitic languages you would know how important that is that book is on our website as well uh, the book the perfect Quran by brother Mark <clears throat> that entire book is online on the website answering islamorg so if you can't get a hard copy or a paperback edition, edition of the book uh, I don't know if it was not hard copy but yeah. with that said you can go to the website and read the book for free by going to answering-islam.org. There, when you get to the main page, you're going to see a section that says the Quran. When you see that section, click on that section, and then you're going to see various links discussing various aspects of the Quran. One will say textual integrity. Click on that link, and we give you uh, documentation from Muslim sources that the Quran is missing verses yes. and chapters. And then in that very link, when you click on Textual Integrity, you will find a link to the book, which you can read entirely for free online, A Perfect Quran uh, by Brother Mark. So go there and do the research for yourself to see that these are sources uh, that admit Islamic sources, information from Muslim sources, Muslim scholars, hadiths, you name it, that admit that there are missing passages missing surahs. And uh, on the website they have, just like here in the yes. book, all of the, the pictures of the different <laughs> Quranic script that you can see for yourself. Absolutely, without a doubt, the Quran has been corrupted. And uh, by the way, Shabir Ali, which is uh, one of the highest esteemed apologists in Islam, there, yeah. there's a quote from him in a uh, debate in Atlanta in uh, Georgia 2000. He says, it doesn't, and I quote, it doesn't matter if the Quranic manuscripts are corrupted or have evolved. Let me repeat that. It doesn't matter if the Quranic manuscripts are corrupted or have evolved as long as we have a picture of the true Jesus. Now, I'd like to know the context there, but uh, what an admission from Shabir Ali. It does, he's saying, and of course, I would imagine the context is people presenting evidence that it has, in fact, been corrupted. And he said, it doesn't matter if the Quranic text has been corrupted. So maybe we'll have some people that will say that, but... Uh, no, I, I can imagine, let's say the debate was about 